Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. And thank you for bearing with us with the technical difficulties. We'll just wait a moment while we welcome everyone in the alternative path to the webinar today. Um, and yeah, that, there's a lot of people joining us now um, and we really appreciate the flexibility here. As someone mentioned, we love technology. <laughs> Amazing. I'll just give it a, one more minute and then, um, then we'll dive into it. I'm conscious we're five minutes late, um, but yeah, everyone seems to, to be understanding. So thank you very much. Really looking forward to getting into a, a really uh, valuable discussion, I think today as well. Okay. All right, now I think a few more people will join us, but I will get started given that we've, um, we've just started a little bit later than anticipated. Okay, well, firstly, welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining this conversation despite the, the little challenges that we've had at the start. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the owners of the various that we're all meeting from. For me, that's the Camaragal people of the Eora Nation, and for all of us to pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Now, we are recording this session and we will aim to have that live uh, forever live on LinkedIn as well, um, but we'll, um, we will see how that goes. But regardless, um, we'll be able to share this as, uh, as a Zoom uh, recording as well. And of course, welcome panellists. Uh, we have here today Leighton Helen Williams, Workplace Engagement Manager at Black Dog Institute. We have Emma Walsh, founder of Family Friendly Workplaces and of course, CEO of Parents at Work. And my co-founder, Stephanie Roos, co-founder and co-CEO at Beamable. So Leighton, could you please give us a quick intro to Black Dog and its role in sustainable working and mental health? Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I'm coming from Darwaland today. And uh, the Black Dog Institute is a mental health research organization um, that basically has many, many different areas. But I'm coming to you from the workplace education uh, branch of the organization. And what we do is we try to bring evidence-based resources and education to workplaces all across the country. Um, and our view at Black Dog is that uh, creating a mentally healthy workplace is something that exists at the organization team and individual level. Um, and that absolutely mentally healthy workplaces directly relate to workplaces that are sustainable. So I'm looking forward to having a chat today about some practical interventions and uh, pieces of information that will help organizations think more broadly about creating a mentally healthy workplace and making sure people are working in a sustainable environment. Amazing. Thank you, Leighton. Sure. Uh, and Emma, what role uh, do your organisations play in this space? Oh, thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. Great to be here having this conversation. Well, as the name suggests, Family Friendly and Parents at Work, we're all about how do we make workplaces more sustainable um, around how we connect our work and home life. And really, our mission is about how do we help people thrive at work and at home and as so many of us know um, doing work at home which is where I am now on Camaragal land too um, is really the new future of work and so how do we really reconcile that and you know this is not a new problem but perhaps one that uh, is more heightened we're, met, we're so aware of it post-COVID um, I think you know the, the live streaming as we're having it and and being in each other's lives and homes in so many more ways than we were once before is there is a newfound empathy I think for the way that we connect work and family and home life and so it's all about how do we grapple with that as we sort of return to a, a new norm uh, and link those two together so we're about helping workplaces in particular think about their policies and practices um, around how they communicate um, work-life sustainability, really. So it, it's all about joining those dots. 
Amazing, Emma. Uh, great perspectives. And um, Steph, as well, uh, uh, what would you say about the work we do at Beamable in this context? Um, hi, everyone. I'm really looking forward to the conversation and particularly hearing your questions as well. Um, so from to answer your question, Vic, I think at Beamable, obviously, we set up the business to largely solve this challenge to um, make sure that people have more work options and to be able to figure out the science behind um, the way that we design jobs and teams and organisations to be really just focusing on the most important work um, at a level that is sustainable and that it's going to have people focused on their highest value work, but work they love as well. So, um, you know, we're obviously seeing some great results with that, but learning a lot along the way in terms of um, the way organisations are using it and what they need it for and how they can best support their people. Amazing. Well, thank you, Leighton, Emma and Steph for joining to share your personal and professional perspectives on solutions for really sustainable work, which is such an important issue uh, to discuss in Mental Health Month. Uh, to everyone joining live, I'm going to go out on a limb and assume you care deeply about the connection between ensuring sustainable workloads and health. Um, that you have personal experience with this issue, can see it happening around you, or perhaps you have responsibility for people at your organisation. Thank you for caring and really engaging in this conversation. So we're going to have a really fast paced dynamic conversation about this issue, and we welcome all of your questions. So please feel free to add them to the chat here at any time, and we'll get to them after a few key questions to the panel up front. Uh, our whole thing at Beamable is about spending time wisely, so we'll do our absolute best to make this a really high valuable um, and a high value use of your time. So let's get into it. Um, so workloads have exploded, as we all know. Uh, the velocity of work continues to really increase with a skill shortage most teams now operate with a gap in their team. Um, and that's, of course, while managers or teammates don another hat to cover open roles. Priorities and projects pile on. And for many, workloads have become unsustainable. Now, in 2019, work-related stress was the fifth leading cause of death in the US. The pace of work has only sped up since then. So, Leighton, coming from Black Dog Institute, have you seen an increase in concern over unsustainable jobs and, in particular, unsustainable workloads? Yeah, absolutely. Um... I think it's an interesting way in which we find this out from our clients at Black Dog. So we hear from hundreds and hundreds of organizations every year. And sometimes the way that this comes to us is people actually reaching out saying, we need resilience training. And it's interesting to us and all the people in the workplace engagement team that I'm a part of, is we always say that's just a little bit of a red flag. So whenever somebody just says, we need resilience training, um, our uh, initial reaction is always, okay, let's slow down. Because of course, resilience training is essential for individual well-being and developing coping skills and all of that, which is extremely valuable. But when a workplace reaches out to us and their first conversation with us is about resilience, that makes us want to have a broader conversation about what brought that organization to us. So typically we'll say, what types of events, changes, challenges are, your, are you guys facing within your workplace that made you reach out to ask about resilience training? And normally what we start finding out through discussion is that there are things that relate directly to things like job design, job demands, not meeting the supports and resources available, lack of role clarity, and all of those would sit at that organizational level that I mentioned at the beginning of this chat. Um, and then we also, tend to unpack a bit about at the team level and the skills that exist in leadership about noticing changes in employee behavior, noticing whether or not people are actually coping. And if that is a work-related issue that should be addressed from a more practical standpoint in terms of, of job load and all of that stuff that's coming onto their plates. So the way that we often hear about, you know, basically unsustainability in workplaces is people reaching out, starting kind of at that micro level. So we need our people to cope. Um, and what Black Dog's approach to that would be is really looking at the, our view that mental health is actually the foundation of a mentally healthy workplace, the, the skills that exist there, health as a key priority, and that resiliency is actually a skill 
that sits on top of that foundation. Mm -hmm. um, but you really do require a shared language and understanding around mental health well-being, which does include absolutely things like job design and things like that. And then on top of that, when those needs are met, then we can start looking at that micro level, the individual level, um, different things that we can do um, as an employee to cope with things that are outside of our control. So we know that stress at work is absolutely uh, a part of life, um, but what we're actually trying to hone in on is organizations understanding what does uh, kind of sustain unmanaged stress? What risk does that bring upon your organization? And are there things that need to be changing at each of those three levels um, in order to actually address the key issue? So what we hear from workplaces, we need resilience training, is tends to turn into a much bigger discussion. Well, I can imagine, absolutely. Um, and look, Emma, uh, a, a very different perspective, but around the boundaries, um, you know, I guess having changed, seen the large scale change that we've seen uh, with organisations and the, the whole world really moving to a remote first or hybrid way of working. What are the implications of this, good uh, or bad, for employees and their families? Yes, I often talk about the, I guess, the blend between work and home life now is without boundaries in many instances. And look, there have been, you know, such developments in technology, haven't there, over the last decade or so, which means that our ways and means of connection are much greater. So that, that's good on the one hand. Um, but the downside is that we're always on and connected. So just think about all the different tools and technologies that we have at our disposable, at, you know, at our disposal, either at work or at home in ways to be constantly communicating. And they're almost endless. And most people now in a workplace are dealing with everything from, you know, the usual ways of connection of um, their systems at work and, and email, but now we've got on top of that often Teams and Zoom and, and WhatsApp and, and text and, and so on. So the barrage of information that we're having to process and deal with, if you like, at any one time um, is hugely increased in the last decade. And in many settings, we're trying to do both at the same time, you know, half cooking the dinner and applying to a WhatsApp text that might have come through from work, et cetera. And so the ability to really try and, if you like, separate and create time and space to really think um, and deliberately, uh, as you talked about using time wisely, uh, think about what's really needed of me right now. Where does my intention and focus need to be? It's actually really hard for people to do because this constant distraction that, that we've got to always be connected and be on it is really hard. And so um, I'm not sure how well employers really understand the impact of that because there's been, you know, on the upside, great um, effort from workplaces to try and help people work from home well. Um, so they tend to put on even more systems and tools and connectivity. And often we'll hear from people around, for example, the challenge of, oh, I might have been away from my desk doing something. But in the meantime, I've had a phone call and email, um, a call on Teams, um, you know, a WhatsApp text. And, you know, before I've got back to my desk an hour later, you know, someone's tried to contact me in three different communication methods. And so the stress and the challenge that that puts on people to always be communicating, I think, is high. On the flip side at home, what's going on in people's homes? <laughs> um, you know, I don't think, you know, I've worked from home and had flexibility in my business for a very long time, but I don't think um, my family know my work and what I do better than what they do now, having actually gone through the pandemic. It is absolutely seeped into every corner of our, our household, every bedroom in our household, our work has been done. Um, and so are we really thinking about the impact of that on family relationships, um, on, on the tension? On the upside, my children are more um, understanding and empathetic. They're a little older now. I've got teenagers and, and one still in primary school. But there's an appreciation for what we're doing and, and what the challenges are and needing to be in multiple places at any one time. But equally, it's like, oh, when can I get your time? Um, you know, can I interrupt now? Am I allowed to come into that bedroom or that study? And, and I don't know that we're really understanding yet what the outcome of that will be on family relationships and time over time. And I think we need to be understanding and measuring work-life integration and well-being in workplaces. And I don't think we are. Um, and so really family-friendly workplaces is about how do we 
set some standards so we do have some boundaries and how do we measure as an organization how we're going with with that and so it is about first of all having good policies and being really clear about what your organization is going to do around the way it supports people and and actually having practices in place that make that a reality um, and it does we have to be deliberate about this because otherwise it, you know we're going to find ourselves in kind of a chaotic mess trying to juggle all of these things and hope you know as you heard from Leighton oh gosh we need now resilient training oh we need this now we need this now and really throwing stuff hoping it's going to stick um, but I think we actually need to go back to some some basics and actually set some standards in organisations around what's acceptable. Yeah. Thank you, Emma. And thank you, Ed, for your question. Um, uh, that's noted and we will come back to that uh, shortly as well. So thanks for, for asking. Um, I guess just to build, uh, you know, on what you have just mentioned now around, you know, even with boundaries, people are really too busy. And um, Mercer's 2022 Global Talent Trends Research found that 81% of employees are burned out. Now, this is one of the worst consequences of really unsustainable workloads. Um, in the past, the onus has been on the individual to solve, as we've sort of discussed, as, and many organisations have provided more of the self-care solutions through yoga, therapy and car maps. Um, but, you know, the... The World Health Organization has included burnout in its international classification of diseases, describing it as an organizational problem that requires really organizational solutions. So we're also seeing a push to change the regulations on psychological injury. So with more and more of a regulatory onus on organizations, um, in Victoria, we're seeing psychological health regulations, which aim to reduce the psychological hazards and injuries in the workplace requiring employers to assess and monitor and mitigate in the same way they would a physical hazard. So Leighton, what is Black Dog's perspective on this um, and who is responsible for work-related stress and burnout? I think that all of the regulatory things that we're seeing evolve are great. I think that there's a bit of risk around just kind of falling into a compliance category versus people taking kind of personal responsibility for the ways that their teams and their people are actually coping and operating. Um, when it comes to who owns burnout, and I, I'm sorry to repeat myself, but I'm going to break it down to more practical examples. But we do believe it exists at the organization team and individual level. So the ways that we might break that down is that the organizational level, part of what Emma was just saying, is you need to have policies and procedures that are in place that support people when they tip over, when they have what I like to call just a human experience at work that has an adverse mental health impact. Um, one of my phrase, favorite phrases to say is don't make people trailblaze their own well-being strategy at work. Um, create these policies and procedures, but then apply case studies that bring those policies to life. So um, Black Dog does a lot of consulting. We do something called the workplace audit tool. That's like a holistic piece of consulting. And often when we talk about policies and procedures, our next question is almost always, but do people know how to enact that policy for themselves or who they contact to enact that policy or um, what are the steps to putting that policy in place for themselves? Um, are there different supports and resources linked to that policy? So I would really encourage organizations thinking in, in human terms of these policies and procedures and not a compliance tick the box exercise. Um, at that organizational level as well, we always are gonna come back to job design, but in consultation with the people actually doing the work, um, often these consultations don't involve the people who are actually on the ground and aren't able to communicate what their actual needs and challenges are. Um, so that absolutely is important. At the team level, um, it's important for people leaders to know they're not solely responsible for the mental health and well-being of each individual but they absolutely have some responsibility in ensuring that their team is supported if they are going through a period of workplace you know, stress, burnout, but also, to, like I said, those human events, it could also be grief, loss, relationship breakdowns, the many, many things that can impact how you're coping and traveling as an individual, which will link to your workplace. Um, but we need managers that actually know how to have effective mental health conversations and effective check-ins 
I actually had the opportunity to speak to about 200 lawyers yesterday about effective mental health check-ins. And I hear a lot of workplaces saying, you know, I'm always checking in my team, saying, how are you going? And I would say, how are you going is a greeting, not a check-in. Um, we need to be actually more specific in our intent when we're checking in on well-being. So when we're having one-on-ones, we need managers going through all the professional stuff that's super important at the beginning, but then allotting time at the end to say, and actually I want to take a few minutes to talk about how busy it's been, how full on it's been. I also know you've got some stuff going on at home. You mentioned to me, I want to talk about how you are doing with your well-being and how you're coping and managing at the moment. Can you tell me how you're navigating this really busy time period? I'd love to hear how you look after yourself. And I want to be looking out for you as well and figuring out the ways I can support you at work. But we also need managers that understand that it is their responsibility that if somebody does disclose that they're not coping, that they need to offer things like reasonable adjustments. That's more of a legal perspective. So that's compliance. But what if we had managers who use things like reasonable adjustments as an early intervention strategy? Mm -hmm. So I know you guys have, um, you know, let's say during COVID, for example, you had a bunch of family members that were sick. They're working from home. I know you're taking care of half your household right now. Um, I just wanted to let you know that I'd love for you to maybe reduce your hours for the next week. Like just, I want you to get adequate rest. I want you to feel like you can take breaks. So managers can be a bit more proactive in offering those types of things. So we want to make sure managers know their roles, responsibilities, and are a little bit more proactive about offering practical support. And they also need to know how to effectively guide someone to support if they need individual one-on-one -on -one professional support. So it's, an, it's great to say, if you need anything, call the EAP. Um, it's better to say, do you know the steps to book an EAP appointment and to maybe give people some insights on what to expect from the service. So that would be lifting up that capability. And then on the individual level, we do need to increase our own self-awareness. So am I an overachiever that's prone to getting stressed out and burnout? Um, do I live with depression, anxiety, or things that absolutely need a health management plan? And am I engaging in the, the things that I need, the services I need to look after my own health and well-being? So we do have an individual responsibility to you know, know thyself and make sure that you're putting steps in place to look after your health the same way anybody would if they were managing any other chronic condition. So if you are chronically prone to stress, it is essential that you actually tap into one-on-one -on -one individualized services, either, either through an EAP or a mental health care plan through a GP, and build up a strategy to look after yourself and prioritize your health. So all of these things cannot operate in a silo. They all have to be working together. Um, but I do think that that's one of the things that we can all be better at uh, is as an organization, do we explain to each of these levels, this is what we expect from you in supporting us to create a mentally healthy workplace. These are your roles and responsibilities in that. And here's what we're doing and what we're working on. Um, so I would say burnout is, is absolutely a shared responsibility. Um, but I don't think that um, it's always the clearest thing that people know exactly what they're meant to be doing to look after themselves, their teams and the organization. Thanks, Leighton. And, you know, I think there's a, a lot of the onus is also put on managers, which is, is pretty hard because actually the manager role is one of the most challenging in an organisation. They're obviously sandwiched from both sides in terms of expectations and needs and um, all of those different things. So I think Steph, you know, it'd be really interesting. I think Steph, uh, sorry, Leighton's mentioned a couple of times uh, job design being a really important part of this. So can you explain a little bit more about what that means and, you know, how that might be helpful for the likes of managers and other important roles within the organisation? Yeah, um, absolutely. And Ed, I'll answer your question here as part of this as well. So um, job design, or you might hear work design, it sounds very HRE and typically it's been in the domain of um, organisation design experts, but actually we just need to um, make it more mainstream. What we're just talking about is, and the definition of it is what is the work that we need to do and which people are going to do it. So um, I think Nicole Lamoureux, who's the Chief People Officer of IBM, says it really nicely. Um, uh, quote so since not since the industrial revolution of companies really had to think about work design so what tasks get done where do those tasks get done and when and how do you deconstruct work so it's done in an optimal manner basically what we're talking about and ed to answer your question 
Um, actually, I'll just read the question for everyone. So as an observation, I've seen workloads explode since COVID across the board on the back of known people and skills disruptions and now shortages. How would you offer solutions to small business owners at the coalface who are battling prolonged fatigue and survival versus the corporates that have more resources to show throw at the issues? Okay. So using the job design, work design approach, what, you, what we're really talking about is that you do have really high work demands and you do have limited resources because of these, you know, people and fiscal and skills shortages. So what we need to do is to actually break down what work we need to get done and prioritise it. So we can't do everything. Um, I'm not, I, know, I, don't, I know it's not easy, so it's not as simple as this, but we do need to actually break it down into chunks. So what do people do now? What do they spend their time on? Then we need, so that's our kind of step one, get your current state of what we're doing. Step two is then scenario plan. So using your, um, using sort of an analysis of that work, what work is keep the lights on, um, you know, and, and compliance related, what work is critical to our growth and survival and then it's everything else that kind of goes into this bucket for you to, to decide if we have any resources left and any capacity left, then how do we get that work done as efficiently as possible? And if we do need to look at different resourcing options because we can't find particular skills, then we might need to shuffle some work around so that people are really working on um, the 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 projects or the customer facing work or the development work or whatever it is that is at, um, using their skills most wisely and anything that could be done by someone more junior or an outsourced you know, gig worker or contractor or something like that, anywhere we can find additional sort of capacity, how can we distribute it there? Um, the health profession uses this term that people should work at the top of their license which means, you know, if you're a brain surgeon, you're going to do most of your work in the surgery doing that, you know, they're not going to be making the appointments, for instance. And I think, you know, with scarce resources, obviously, and doing that incredible work, we could take a leaf from their book to really start to be more conscious and thoughtful about the work that each of our people are doing, working at the top of their license, but also doing the work they love. So they're really energised by it. Thanks so much, Steph. That's a, um, you know, great to have some really practical um, ways to think about how we break down work and reassign it and redistribute it across the team or think of creative ways um, as well to, to resource. So I'm just going to change um, tack a little bit and uh, share a little story with you. Um, so a person is walking along a riverbank and notices a man dragging people from the water. The man brings each person to safety on the bank and resuscitates them one at a time. And he tells the passerby he is a doctor and explains that he's been so busy saving people's lives, he has had no time to venture upstream to discover why so many people are falling into the river in the first place. Now, this upstream health parable is certainly attributed, uh, sorry, is attributed to Irving Zola and a medic who is a medical sociologist and disability rights campaigner uh, in the 1980s. And he, this was really to highlight how the vast majority of medical practice was reactive rather than proactive. And I think we all agree that we desperately need upstream interventions rather than downstream. Um, and so Steph, what upstream interventions have you seen working with clients you've been working with? Um, so I'll just answer, I'll try and answer this very quickly because I realise I've just been um, talking a lot. But um, the most important upstream interventions are to get visibility into the facts. So if we're all burning out and working on too much stuff, why is that? Is that the right stuff? Are we just misaligned in terms of what's important? Are there projects that people are working on that actually you know, aren't critical or we actually don't um, really care about from a business um, outcomes perspective. So we need to get visibility first and foremost. Second, we are going to have to make workload adjustments and that's going to mean trade-offs mean trade on the work that actually gets produced. The good news is that um, certainly through our work, we do see even in the most high-performing teams and organisations that there is wasted effort that just simply by having the conversation and getting visibility into what people are working on, we can say, actually, 
you shouldn't be spending a day on that a week or it's okay not to come to these meetings if we're spending you know 50 percent 60 percent of our time in the internal meetings change the cadence of those meetings um or potentially you know um prioritizing some client groups over others and putting in different service levels. there's all sorts of different ways to think about it but getting that visibility does help us to adjust workloads it's worth bearing in mind that um Gallup research showed the tipping point for burnout is about 50 hours a week on average at, on a sustained period of time and rises even more dramatically at 60 hours. So I think we can all, you know, we all know what it feels like to be working really long hours um, consistently, but being able to measure that through, you know, engagement surveys, but also through just looking at um, actual workloads will give you an idea of the risk you have. Um, and then, yeah, so getting visibility, then looking at different scenarios to adjust workloads and then putting that into place. So I think Leighton, we completely agree with you, having that clarity between leaders and those that form the strategy and every and managers and then everyone else in the organisation about what those important priorities are is um, key. But then also making sure that managers, we're coming back to managers again, have that um have the ability to have those conversations. So completely agree, it's it's a capability um, or an upskill for managers. They have been asked to do a lot and a lot more over the last couple of years. Um, and in fact, they're one of the groups that is at most risk of burnout themselves. So we need to make sure they are given license um, to have the answer. And we're able to say, you are feeling overwhelmed, burned out. We have tools and ways for you to work through different work options right now and I think we'd all agree as um, business owners that particularly with the skills shortage we can't afford to have people leaving we'd prefer them to have the conversation up front upstream rather than downstream when we're having an EAP or a sustained you know um, uh, sick leave period of time or they resign mm. yeah great point um, I will just ask, uh, feel free to uh, everyone who's joining us to put some questions into the chat. Uh, we're welcoming any questions um, as we go. Uh, and so, um, you know, please just add anything that you might like to ask any of the panel. Um, okay, well, I think, Steph, just to your point around, um, uh, you know, around how uh, the upstream interventions that are, are working, I guess there could be a bit of a disconnect as well because this month's um, uh, Microsoft Work Trend Index uh, discovered a profound problem at work where 87% uh, of employees believe that they are really highly productive, yet only 12% of CEOs agree. So the Microsoft research really found that people are really busy employee meetings increased by 153% and double booked meetings increased by 46%. So Leighton, how would you suggest that we would resolve this disconnect uh, between, I guess, the people and uh, the leaders? Well, I think when it comes to, well, what we're really talking about is, is around role clarity and within role clarity is the definition of success. And there's nothing more frustrating to anyone that's trying to perform in their role to not feel like they understand what the organization's perception of success in that role is. Um, I would say that's a sad story, isn't it? To, to hear all these people working themselves to the bone and their CEOs aren't feeling like they're being productive. Um, and I guess there are two things at play there. Um, CEOs that are feeling that way absolutely have a, a duty of care to their organization to understand what is actually transpiring in their workplace and what are some better ways of actually telling the story of what different departments and teams are doing, creating, working on, and making sure you understand the broader picture. I think that one of the risks in kind of talking about these different concepts as concepts, job design, role clarity, all that stuff, is again, we have to bring in the human factor and a lot of what we talk about when we're talking with workplaces one-on-one -on -one is how do you tell the story of what this team is doing and how are even within a team, are people communicating from managers to employees or even peer to peer about what they're working on, what they need support with. Um, and this kind of comes back into, are we actually checking in on the things that actually matter? 
Um, are we kind of just ticking the box in all of our different team meetings? And we're not actually evaluating whether or not we're covering the things that are most important to us or allowing us to actually be effective and sustainable. So I'd say in this case, there is a complete lack of role clarity that is happening in a lot of organizations. And, and there really isn't any adequate storytelling that's getting to the top about what people are doing. Um, because I think that that sounds like a, a really a recipe for very unfulfilled, burned out people who are absolutely going to start looking for the next opportunity if you don't feel appreciated, rewarded, recognized for the work that you're doing, or even worse, perceived that you're not even being productive um, on top of all of that. So I guess for me, absolutely role clarity. But then I think the storytelling piece is something organizations need to be a bit better about making sure that all of the hard work that their people are putting um, into their roles and into their projects and into their day-to-day, -day, wh whether or not it is a corporate, it might be people who are working in cafes or what, whatever it might be, are we actually saying what they're contributing to the workplace, reflecting on that and being aware of what all of our different people are contributing to our broader you know, organizational strategy and our organization's uh, definition of success as well? Yeah. Definitely clarity is a, a big part of it. Um, and actually, uh, Rachel, a uh, great question um, that you've mentioned here. I'm just gonna read it out. Uh, Emma mentioned uh, that we need to measure the success and impact of work and home integration on families. Do you have ideas on how we go about starting that? So, uh, you know, really good point around measurement. And I think that goes across all of the things that we've discussed today. Um, Emma, what are your thoughts in terms of that work and home integration? Yeah, it's a great question. I was just, you know, really thinking and pondering, um, hearing all of your comments. I mean, because I sit here not only as, you know, a supposed expert at work and life balance, and I don't always get it right all, all at, you know, all the time at all, um, but I also sit here as a small business owner. And, you know, the challenges of looking after a team through COVID and all the things we've had to grapple with. And I think, you know, it comes down to a couple of things. One is that uh, COVID has accelerated the need for every business to transform. And so what might have been sort of at pace, kind of consistent business improvement, kind of innovation on the side, suddenly had to get sped up. In, in warp speed ways that none of us appreciated would have to happen through COVID. And I'm not sure that our people's strategies have caught up. So we've got these CEOs leading out the charge with, gosh, we've had, you know, we have to turn our business in, inside out and do it differently. Um, we have to be hungry for growth. It needs to look like this now. We can't, we can't be where we were in 2019. Um, and how well they've been able to translate that change in mission, that or that change in priority. Um, is questionable, particularly given many of us have had to work remotely. And we know that if we take people through change, you know, the, the theory of change, um, there's lots of interventions and steps that have to happen if we're going to bring people along the change journey. And so I think we do have these business leaders sort of out the front, really clear about the change that needs to happen. But we've certainly got um, employees that may not have heard all of the um, sense of urgency around that or the need to change and what that actually means for them. And so I, I think that's really important. And the second thing is that time is our most important asset. Um, you know, we can't get it back. We can't speed it up. We can't save it up. Um, and in fact, how we use our time impacts absolutely everything in our lives, um, right through to our health, our family relationships, our business outcomes. And so we absolutely need to be ruthless with our time and think of it as our most important asset and how we deploy it. Um, and busy is always a worry for me when I hear that in our business, I'm really busy um, because that already says to me, uh, out of control, uh, don't, you know, have time to think. Um, and so often when I hear that feedback in our business on something in particular, um, I immediately stop, ask for that feedback, tell me what's going on. What are you really busy with? Um, how can I help? And we have this dialogue at there and then in the moment around what might be going on. And, it, and I'm listing out for, is that a one-off problem? Is that a sustained problem? Um, you know, is that something we really need to have an intervention and a fix for? Or is this just a moment that person needs to actually have that conversation and, and then we move on and we're better? Um, and I, I preface all of that in the answer to this question, because if we are not seeking feedback 
on a daily, weekly and, and longer term basis from our people, really listening to them around what is going on in their lives in any given day or week, um, then we don't really know what's going on in our organisation, where time wastage is happening, what we need to be doing to support them. So I, I always come back to the role of a leader really fundamentally is to listen and always seek feedback. And if we are not prioritising that in our leadership role, then we are always probably going to feel like we are being reactive, chasing our tail, trying to figure out what's wrong, um, you know, fix stuff. And so that comes back to the measurement of this work, what we would call out this work-life well-being. And so we need to do it in this sort of anecdotal way, which is always being able to do the normal check. And I'll come back to Leighton's comment around you know, how are you today, um, isn't really going to do it. Um, we need to be asking um, more pointed questions when we are having that moment of interacting with the key people that make a difference in, in our immediate um, world as leaders that we're working with. And the questions look like this. How is your week going? What's on your plate? Right, it's specific, it's direct. It gives an opportunity to really have a conversation about what genuinely is going on. And I like it because it's an open question and it allows really for people to be able to share personally and professionally what's going on for them in any given week. And so that's a really great way of anecdotally um, getting, you know, having those conversations. And I think organisations need to be making sure that leaders are prioritising that. On the, on the broader scale, we need to start thinking about um, assessing whether we do in fact have the right policies and processes in place around what supports good work-life well-being and that's what all family-friendly workplaces is about it's about benchmarking where you're at do we have the right things in place and as Leighton said are we promoting it properly because if we're not um, then there's no point having those policies or practices in place if people don't understand how they can be utilized that that's leaders and employees so we need um, to be benchmarking ourselves as an organization in where, in where we're at. And um, that's the tool we've set up with Family Friendly Workplaces. It's free to do the assessment. So why wouldn't you, as an employer, really find out where you're at um, and really start to think about what you need to do and commit to an action plan on it? So a rather long answer, but I just wanted to sort of sum up some of the things that, you know, have been said today um, across a number of different, um, you know, fields. That's brilliant, Emma, and thank you so much. I, I think um, great answer and, you know, really great to hear, you know, things around benchmarking um, and being able to, see, you know, identify whether there is op really, um, you know, what are the practical solutions that you can put in place uh, to, you know, improve those benchmarks as well. I think uh, measurement's a really interesting one um, and no doubt uh, there are a number of surveys going uh, around and continue to highlight the challenge of workloads being an issue. Um, and a big part of uh, burnout and, and partly um, informing, you know, concerns around engagement as well. So, Steph, a question to you around, I guess, the next click down on measurement around, you know, how do you look at workloads? What sort of measurement can we do across workloads? Um, and, uh, you know, really understand the work that people are doing as well. Sure. So, um yeah, often because I think what Vicky are talking about is um, as well, you get these engagement surveys that tell you workloads are an issue or even as a smaller business, you'll just observe it. And as business owners, we always take on the, um, you know, the, okay, I'll take it, I'll take it, I can take it, you know, I can take more and more and more as well. And, and that applies to managers too. Um, but what we do see, and we work a lot of organisations on this, is that... Um, even the most senior, the most hardworking, um, not, I won't say hardworking, sorry, long, long hours working um, people are able to lift up and take a moment um, as a circuit breaker to look at what they're doing and to make some decisions about, I think, Emma, what you called ruthless, ruthless prioritisation. So we do need to... Um, we do need, even though we're feeling the most, you know, when we're feeling the most overwhelmed um, and, you know, at risk of burnout, we just can't stop because we've just got to get stuff done. That is when, you know, you need to stop and breathe. And there's all sorts of, you know, things that you need to do for self-care. But one of them is making a plan. You really just need to make a plan and come up with some different options of how you can get on top of this and find a sem some semblance of, um, um, a, a, 
a, a light at the end of the tunnel, I'll say, in terms of how am I going to work towards that answer. And we certainly need organisations to support that and to give licence to people to have the conversation because we just don't know how to say no now. When more projects fly at us or more asks come at us, we really aren't wired to say no. And so we need to be able to have a different conversation, which is um, if I've got all these different things on, I think that, you know, I've looked at it and I think these are the most important priorities. Do you agree? Right? But by actually breaking it down and saying, this is taking me this long, this project's taking me this long. My one-on-ones with my team are taking that long. I think that's a priority. Do you agree? Or we could change the cadence. Really granular, really tactical stuff. And that helps us to form a path and have a conversation that's constructive um, and get agreement that that's the path forward. So I think that's the simplest, easiest thing, you know, that you can do. And it might take half an hour. So it might be on the couch at night. Um, but, yeah, and... Um, uh, if you take me back to a moment um, in my earlier career and, it, you know, where I kind of hit that moment and uh, it was actually probably, I think, seven or eight o'clock at night at a desk in a job I was working in. And I went, right, that's it. I can't do this anymore. That burnout moment where I literally sat down for the next hour and wrote down everything that I was responsible for doing, felt, um, yeah, an owner, owner of responsibility to deliver. And I think I wrote five pages and I literally reflected on it and went, this is ridiculous. I can't do all of this. This isn't sustainable. And I call that role creep. And I, role creep had just taken over. <laughs> it was unruly. And I remember thinking, right, that, that's it. This has to be reorganised. And really literally taking a highlighter through and going, this is what I think I'm paid to do. This is the bit I'm really supposed to do and what I think makes a difference. And everything else, well, that's peripheral. And I now need to decide where, what happens with that. And it really allowed an excellent conversation the next day with my leader where I literally was able to say, hey, you know what? I went through this um, and, you know, this is what I understand I'm really here to do. Um, this is the difference I think you want me to make. Um, this is where I think I should be spending my time. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, well, what are we going to do about all those other tasks that I've written down here? Because their noise, their distractions, their peripheral, you know, to what extent do I need to worry about those things? And it just opened up. The most amazing dialogue and I can tell you any other time in my career that I've felt that I've done the same exercise so you're right make a plan write it down it's nothing like seeing it in front of you everything you're holding on to in your head to go actually what of this really matters what am I here and paid to do um, versus what's peripheral and actually I stop doing it I move to somebody else or I have a real conversation about whether this is actually needed so it, um, it is very practical and it can help enormously in that moment, manager overwhelm. Yeah, thanks, Emma. And um, just if anyone on the call is personal, so there'll be managers and there'll be people from HR and there'll be different people here. If anyone personally is struggling with it, um, there is a free option to use Beamable for this. And the highlighter that we use is, you know, what are you paid to do? So what's the valuable work? What's the work that energises you? you know, and what does the world sort of need? So, um, and then um, all the other stuff you can kind of put into an unallocated bucket and have a conversation about that. So it's very much on your page, Emma, but it does help to present a business case and, um, you know, to stakeholders or your manager. So I encourage you to do that. And in fact, if someone from um, Jordana, perhaps if you can pop, pop the link in, that'd be great. Thanks. Um, and, you know, great discussion here in terms of uh, the measurement. It really it does start with visibility, though, doesn't it? And just really being able to shine a light on uh, what's actually the current state and then making a plan for, for future state as well. I might just quickly um, pivot, you know, uh, to the, you know, now and our last few minutes uh, to the, uh, to really thinking about productivity. Uh, there are some real cost drivers and productivity reasons for organisations to take a, a responsibility for sustainable workloads. The costs associated with psychological claims are three and a half times higher than that uh, than the cost of physical injury claims. Now, that's really interesting. And the return to work rate is much lower for people with psychological injuries. Combined with the impact of workers' compensation claims and for large corporate employers, the actual cost of claim um, uh, is having uh, some bearing on the ultimate premium paid. So this means that there are some definite cost drivers there. 
Now, on the flip side, Josh Burson talks about business performance and employee vitality being really optimised uh, when not only health, fitness and well-being, but also sustainable performance is provided to employees and driven from the leadership level. So uh, maybe we could just maybe pop into the chat, you know, just to hear from, from you as the audience as well, but is workload management, work-related stress or burnout on the agenda for your organisation right now? And it might be around productivity, um, uh, but it might be around many different reasons what might be driving that. But if you can just pop into, you know, some thoughts, that'd, that'd be great to see. I guess um, it would be also great to hear from Leighton for organisations motivated to solve this. What does Black Dog actually do to support? Sure. So uh, Black Dog does a few different things. I guess, firstly, I just want to point out that um, I'm part of that workplace engagement team at Black Dog. Any organisation, whether or not they want to purchase a training or anything, is absolutely welcome to reach out to us and book in a meeting and just talk to one of the members of my team. We will do everything we can to offer anything from evidence-based free resources, guide you to providers that do things that we don't do. Um, we jokingly refer to ourselves as mental health concierges in the sense of we'll do everything we can to get you to the right place that's uh, affordable, reasonable for you. Um, but Black Dog does offer, I mentioned the Black Dog audit tool, which is that holistic piece of consulting for organizations that want to have a really big discussion about what it is that they're actually doing in this space. Um, are our, is our approach completely ad hoc? Are we just throwing a bunch of mental health and well-being initiatives that don't, that might even um, not only not reinforce one another, but actually challenge one another's intentions? Um, you know, do we want feedback on the approach that we have from our communications from senior leaders? Um, and then, of course, we deliver training, um, training to senior leaders on workplace protective and risk factors. But again, the Black Dog approach is not to be able to have you list them. Our approach is for you to identify them in a case study and to talk about what would we do at our organization to mitigate this risk or increase this protective factor. So it's all about bringing it to life. Uh, we train leaders in absolutely skills-based training that supports them to have effective conversations, how to receive a disclosure, how to offer reasonable adjustments, how to um, support the return to work process. So Black Dog is not in the business of doing deep dives in the workplace about mental illness. We're looking at what we do to, to be a more mentally healthy workplace that is reasonable and applicable from tomorrow, not just in worst case scenarios. And absolutely, we also train employees that are not leading others on how they can look after each other and themselves and evidence-based approaches to managing stress, things like cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness. But Black Dog also offers lots of free resources in that space from, we have a free website called My Compass, over seven weeks of self-paced online learning about your own mental health and well-being, um, headgear, which is around uh, mindfulness and we call behavior activation therapy, which is engaging in the activities that keep you well. Um, so we'll do all that we can to essentially say, where are you at? What are your goals? Um, and we'll give you as many um, insights and resources as we possibly can for you to make some sustainable change that's based in evidence in your organization. Amazing. Thank you, Leighton. And it sounds like incredible resources there um, that we encourage everyone to be able to tap into. Emma, um, just with a few minutes to go, how can organisations really provide a positive ripple effect to their employees' families rather than the stress ripples, which are unfortunately all too common now? Yeah, well, look, um, I'm going to say it again. I think it's really important that organisations um, get benchmarked, get an, a sense of where they're at in relation to their policies and practices and how well they're actually promoting them because part of this is how family-friendly is the culture of your organisation. And when I use the term family-friendly, it's not just about parents and children. We all belong to families and families need and deserve our time and we do need to balance our work with those commitments around um, family and home life so we definitely need to be making sure that what is the culture we're communicating to our people around 
um, their life outside of work and how much that matters. And so this is beyond the whole bring your best self to work piece and we really want to value that you be you here. This is really going to the next level of understanding and empathy around the important relationships that people have in their lives outside of work that matter. Um, and they absolutely impact an employee's ability to be productive, to be engaged, and we really deeply need to understand that. Um, so uh, I think if organisations are not sure around how family-friendly would their employees rate them, they need to know that information um, and they need to understand what that actually means. So for us, the definition of a family-friendly workplace is the degree to which um, an employee feels tension between work and home life and are they able to effectively uh, bring the two together in a way that works. So um, I think that's a really practical way that organisations you know, can and should be looking at it. I think the other thing that if you're at, in any doubt about whether this is vital or not, I just a reminder that, as I've said, over the last couple of years, we've spent so much time doing our work at home our family and our friends know a lot more about our work than they ever did before. And that means they know who we work for, most likely who our leader is, and most likely how well did that leader and organisation support them during COVID? Were they good? Were they uh, difficult? Uh, were they supportive uh, or not? And they're making a judgment on um, your organisation, your brand. Um, and we have a next generation growing up watching how well their parents and carers have been supported by the people that they work for. So um, how do you want to be judged as an employer? And uh, so, so be aware that it's not only your employees that are experiencing um, what it's like to work with you, it's your employees' families too. Well said, Emma, and thank you all. We are at 11 o'clock now. I want to say thank you to everyone who's joined. Uh, thank you to our panellists, uh, Leighton, Emma and Steph, incredible discussion. I think you'll all agree that you um, there's been some really valuable takeaways from here and hopefully some really practical solutions to implement in organisations or hopefully for yourselves as well. Thank you for your time, everyone. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in the future. Please refer to uh, the, um, the resources that have been posted in here as well and follow up with any of us as a um, if you need any further assistance. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.